Without exception, the others in the crew want immediately to turn back. To do so would admit complete failure. As commander of the expedition, I am determined to continue. I have ordered that we go on under the ice. For 70 years, the secrets of a forgotten polar adventure have been hidden deep in the icy waters of the Arctic. One man's extraordinary dream to take a primitive submarine to the North Pole. Right of the Cold War, America's most powerful weapon, the nuclear submarine USS Skate, was on a secret mission. We're now through the ice at the North Pole, and you can hear the ice working around the ship, among other animal noises. Its objective, to be the first to surface at the North Pole. But its captain, James Calvert, had another aim. He'd come to honor the visionary pioneer who 30 years earlier had been the first to attempt this perilous journey. Not a Navy man, not even an American, but an Australian adventurer, George Hubert Wilkins. We are gathered here today to pay tribute to a great man. resurrection unto eternal life the sea shall give up her dead and then the ashes were thrown pretty much up into the air and the swirling wind picked them and threw them about almost in a kind of a miniature cyclone and then they were spread out on the ice and I couldn't help but think that this was a suitable place for Sir Hubert Wilkins to come to rest Who was this man they'd come so far to honor? And why? It's a far cry from droughts to submarines, but if you follow these stories with patience, you'll learn the connection. I was the baby of the family. My father, 52, and my mother, nearly 50, when I was born. Today, Sir Hubert Wilkins is all but forgotten, but his incredible story lives on in the books and films he left behind. They tell of a childhood marked forever by a bitter struggle with nature. I was good at lessons, and it might have taken me to a higher school, but poverty came and prevented. The country was then entering the worst drought in the history of South Australia. It was this terrible time and the ruin of my family and neighbours that gave me, even as a young boy, much serious food for thought. Why, I wondered, should it not be possible to learn something of the laws which govern the atmosphere and bring about the seasonal rains and droughts? I determined to devote my life to understanding the weather. While circumstances would lead me on many adventures, my life has been spent in pursuit of answers. Wilkins was useful with machinery and soon found work with a traveling cinema. The camera became his ticket to some of the great events of the new century. 
The cinema took me to Sydney, where I stowed away on a steamer bound for Europe. I had the card of a man in London at the Gaumont Picture Company. Gaumont took him on, and the young newsreel cameraman spent the next 50 years recording his own remarkable life. An early assignment introduced another lifelong passion. I learned something of aeroplanes and how to navigate them. I'd later fly all over the world, but I never had a pilot's license. He took what are thought to be the first moving pictures from the air. Wilkins was sent as official cameraman with veteran explorer Wilm Hammer Stephenson, who was searching for a hidden continent in the northern ice. He would learn his polar craft from a master. Here was the chance I'd been waiting for, to join a polar expedition. Funded by the Canadian government, it was the most ambitious and expensive Arctic expedition ever mounted. But it was a chaotic and ultimately tragic affair, which cost the lives of 11 men. Yet Stephenson and his young protégé thrived in the conditions. They spent three years sledging thousands of miles across the frozen ocean, learning to live off the ice like Inuit hunters. Stephenson was the last of the old-style polar explorers. Wilkins would be the first of the new. I never really cared for the hard physical labor of the sledge. As I struggled mile after mile with my heavy camera, I dream of a time I could soar above the ice in my aeroplane and cover as much in a day as we could hope to cover in six months with dog teams. Stephenson, tired of hearing me talk about the possibilities of aeroplanes, and announced dramatically one day that submarines would be a better way. They could float through the ice pack, coming up to the surface to make all the studies that were needed. The First World War interrupted his plans of discovery. As the official cameraman of the Australian troops in the trenches of Europe, Wilkins was bombed, gassed and shrapnel taking these pictures. He was twice awarded the Military Cross, the only Australian photographer of any war to be decorated, yet all the time dreaming of new discoveries. Someday, when the world returns to normal, I hope to sail through the polar skies, not in pursuit of enemies, but of the secrets that would help conquer the natural enemies of all mankind. In the years after the war, he made good his promises as he joined a series of expeditions. First beside men like Shackleton, then in his own right as leader, he opened up some of the world's last unknown regions. Though he explored deserts and jungles, it was his pioneer flights at both poles that marked him one of the giants of exploration, always pushing technology to its limits. Wilkins never sought fame, but he needed money to finance his expeditions. American newspapers were keen to sponsor flying heroes, and they took to the Australians' fearless attitude and calm style. They demanded a story, and Wilkins rarely let them down. It's true that in the past I have been accused of taking risks, but from my perspective they have always been balanced with careful thought and preparation. In any case, an explorer must venture where none have been before, because knowledge lies in the unknown. He made a series of pioneering flights across Alaska. These daring exploits caught the attention of the world's most powerful newspaper baron, William Randolph Hearst. Hearst needed grand adventures to feed his media empire. He'd pay well to get them, 
it would prove to be a fateful relationship between the explorer and the mogul, better known today as the inspiration for Citizen Kane. With Hearst's money, Wilkins would be the first man to fly in the Antarctic. In the flimsy aircraft of the time, it was dangerous work, but Wilkins triumphed and was the first to sight vast regions of the southern continent. He literally changed the map of the world and modestly named part of the Antarctic Peninsula after his powerful sponsor. Hearst was thrilled. A man like this sold a lot of newspapers, yet Wilkins seemed unconcerned with celebrity. From what I studied of Wilkins, I don't think that personal achievement was what he was after. Polar historian Maria Pia Casarini has done the only substantial study of the Wilkins archives. He had this very strong feeling that the world needed to know more scientifically to avoid those terrible droughts that ruined his farm in, um, in Australia, uh, that more um, was needed to know about the polar regions, the climate, the climate of the extreme regions where not many people had gone, uh, same for the Antarctic, and even the geographical um, exploration no, to have an Arctic Ocean and not even knowing whether there was any land. It, it just wasn't uh, acceptable for somebody like him. In 1927, Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic and daring aviators became the rock stars of their age. Meanwhile, Wilkins was quietly preparing a far more dangerous flight across the top of the world from Alaska to Europe. There had been shadowy reports of solid land in the Arctic Ocean. I was anxious to explore this region because land would mean a place for the polar weather stations I had long ago set my mind on. Wilkins was attempting one of the longest flights in history over unmapped and inhospitable territory. Few expected ever to see him again. Almost to a man, they said it couldn't be done. But I needed to resolve once and for all the question of unknown land in the Arctic. The flight solved this last great mystery of geography. It proved there was no hidden continent in the frozen north. Wilkins' stunning achievement had opened the most important route in aviation, connecting Asia, Europe and America by the shortest path. It was hailed as the greatest flight in history. Fated by his peers, honoured by heads of state, the boy from the Australian bush became Sir Hubert Wilkins. At a New York ticker tape parade in his honour, he was introduced to an Australian actress, Suzanne Bennett. He was the most famous man on earth and always in a hurry. He proposed to me on our second date. A grateful Hearst gave them a honeymoon to remember, aboard the only round-the-world flight of the Graf Zeppelin. Now 42 years old, rich and renowned, others may have been content to retire, but the boyhood dreams remained. It is the relentless force of mysterious nature that fashions my thoughts and controls my destiny, and brings me now to undertaking what many consider the most foolhardy of all risks, taking a submarine beneath the Arctic seas. There's a great deal to be done in magnetism. There's a great deal to be done in meteorology. There's a great deal to be done in radio research in the Arctic, and we hope to bring back results that will prove to the world that our expedition has been useful. The extraordinary plan involved taking a submarine thousands of miles under the pole. The sub would be a floating laboratory, coming to the surface to study climate. 
To add to the drama, it would rendezvous at the pole with the Graf Zeppelin. The Hearst Press duly hyped it as the greatest adventure in history. And thus they plan to cross about 1,500 miles of broken ice cakes until they arrive in the open waters to the north of Bering Strait. It was a plan fraught with dangers. Submarines at the time were little more than fragile ships, limited to occasional short dives. Somehow, they hoped to navigate to the North Pole and beyond, hoping for breaks in the ice to surface for air. As it entered the shifting ice sheets of the Arctic, they would be beyond help. But Wilkins, as ever, was confident of success. Now we expect in about six or eight months to have made the trip 2,000 miles under the ice, starting from Spitsbergen somewhere about the 1st of July. The US Navy offered Wilkins an antiquated First War sub that was due to be scrapped. But it would be a race against time to have her modified for the brief Arctic summer. I'm going to name her the Nautilus, like Jules Fern. I expect to spend a lot of money adapting her to our special needs. But just to get the hull is a great start. At the Philadelphia Naval Yards, Wilkins meets with the engineers and the man who will become his chief scientist, Norwegian oceanographer Harald Sverdrup. Well, Harald Sverdrup's given his name to the standard unit of ocean current, the Sverdrup, and he was by far the greatest oceanographer of his era and is still regarded as one of the greatest of all oceanographers. So as a very serious scientist, he certainly wouldn't have been the sort of person to go on a half-baked expedition. But others considered it a suicide mission. The Nautilus could travel just 125 miles before being forced to surface to replenish batteries and air supplies. Yet Wilkins would need to navigate thousands of square miles of uncharted ice pack in the hope of finding breaks through which to surface. It was a plan so unlikely that success could be its only justification. James Calvert knows what it takes to reach the North Pole by submarine. He also knew Wilkins and the realities of what he was attempting. When I went to submarine school in 1942, our training boats were the O-boats, of which the Nautilus, Sir Hubert Wilkins' Nautilus, was one of those O-boats. They were very small and very uncomfortable to live on. I remembered having read about Sir Hubert Wilkins with this voyage, and I thought it was a remarkable effort. But when I saw the submarine and lived in it for a while, I thought it wasn't only remarkable, it was phenomenal that he would have given it a try. There were British critics in the newspapers saying it in no uncertain terms that uh, no, Sir Hubert Wilkins had lost his marbles or something like that. It was very risky, certainly. It was a first, and a first is always risky. But Wilkins had influential supporters, including his old polar mentor, Wilhelm Stephenson. The expedition is very dangerous, but so was the war in which Sir Hubert Wilkins was decorated and so have been his flying expeditions both in the Arctic and Antarctic. Sir Hubert Wilkins, not for the first time, is staking his life now in the interest of science. People wonder whether the scientific results uh, we might achieve on this expedition will be really worth the hazard. Of course, they believe that this is a much more dangerous trip than our airplane flights across the Arctic, but I don't think so. Not an engineer, Wilkins must cede control of the modifications to a local engineering firm run by his new skipper, Sloane Dannenhauer. The firm began installing dozens of expensive and bizarre gadgets. Publicly, Wilkins had to endorse them. Here we have the uh, sort of pneumatic trolley arm. You stick up above the boat, scrape along the bottom of the ice that's along here, 
If we need to, we can lay it right down on the deck, and then bring the whole submarine tight against the ice so that these drills can be operated. But once the cameras were turned off, Wilkins had serious doubts about most of the newly installed contraptions. Much of Dan and Howe's equipment I considered inadequate and unnecessary. The vessel became so crowded it was a marvel of inconvenience. Mechanical things have to be extremely simple to work in the polar regions, in the cold. So you couldn't have these very complicated drills, very complicated uh, uh, jackknife, periscope, all these things that he could just foresee incredibly clearly that would just not work. But he had to accept them because that was the contract. In return for exclusive newspaper rights, Hearst would pay for an attempt on the pole. But his money covered only a fraction of the costs. Wilkins invested everything he had in the venture, tens of thousands of dollars. The bills are rolling in fast. 10, 20, 50, $100,000 are passed. I begin to wonder where the money will come from. I am lecturing day and night to earn as much as I can, as well as borrowing from friends. But there were certainly no concerns when it came to recruiting. The relentless publicity attracted thousands of applicants from all over the world. Mostly they were naval veterans, some good, some desperate for work. When the scientific staff joined, there would eventually be 20 men from 10 different nations. I often wondered why they did it. Don't forget it was during the Depression, it was 1931, and jobs were hard to get. They had a pretty good idea, I think, of what they were getting into, but I don't think they understood the plan for trying to get to the North Pole. Among the crew was a young seaman from Chicago, John Jansen. Jansen celebrated his appointment with a cigar on the Brooklyn Quayside, and his excitement was typical of the crew. Nothing like this has ever been imagined to be part of something that will become one of the great pioneering adventures of all time. The Nautilus made some cautious sea trials, which the Hearst newsreels turned into fully-fledged adventures. Here she is, the Nautilus, a tiny 170-foot submarine which Sir Hubert Wilkins has rebuilt for his cruise under polar ice. 40 feet under the sea in the crowded engine room. 500 horsepower diesel motors, one on each side. Captain Dannenhauer at the periscope. See any icebergs there, Skipper? The naming ceremony was a media event. Among those gathered under the Brooklyn Bridge was the grandson of Jules Verne, Jean, there to see 20,000 leagues under the sea become reality. Lady Wilkins performed the honors. I name you Nautilus. Go on your wonderful adventure. In your heart is great treasure. Bring that treasure safely back to me. But it looks like a wonderful boat. I don't feel much like going off without you. Well, I'm sorry I didn't make up my mind to come along with you. But never mind, I'll see you in London. Well, it won't be long, only two or three weeks, and then I hope you'll be starting over. I'll see you over there. All right, that'll be fine. Nautilus finally set out on the first leg of its journey, a perilous surface crossing of the Atlantic to Europe. Our hearts are beating high. From now on, we will do the job alone. Nautilus was already a month behind schedule and the inadequacies of the old sub were soon exposed. Uh, 
how anyone could live on a submarine like that for more than a day or two at a time. There was no place really to sit down and eat. There was only one head or toilet, which was a large steel bowl mounted up between the two engines in the engine room. So it, it really took somebody with great concentration to have a successful visit to the head there. Trouble has been brewing for us from the time we left. One engine has a leaking cylinder, the other has broken down under the strain. I don't know how in the world these people ever lived. They had to get across the Atlantic Ocean. And this, this submarine was not built for being offshore. Just four days out of New York, with failing engines, Nautilus was being overwhelmed by rough seas. The crew was terrified, as the young Chicago seaman, John Jansen, recalled. Every man on the vessel was scared. We all know the poor condition of the Nautilus for the work she has ahead. Adrift in the mid-Atlantic, with its engines broken down and the crew sick from fumes, the Nautilus sends an SOS. After hours of nervous waiting, they at last saw smoke on the horizon from the US battleship Wyoming. It's a lucky escape. Towed to Britain, the little sub has suffered serious damage. For some of the crew, it's too much. Some announce they are resigning, and the British press are becoming a little more skeptical than their American colleagues. There's the famous submarine. Just imagine being cooped up in that confined space for over a week. With the seas running deck high, all hatches had to be closed and the crew were almost poisoned by the fumes. And there's the bearded Sir Hubert Wilkins, leader of this expedition. More weeks are lost making repairs in Plymouth. Privately, I was appalled at the amount of work which would have to be done. Wilkins must abandon the plan to rendezvous with the Graf Zeppelin. But despite the concerns, the hype rolled on. Newspapers reported a royal visit. The Prince of Wales visited the submarine Nautilus at Plymouth today and wished Sir Hubert Godspeed. It is all intensely interesting, the Prince said. He did not catch his bowler hat on a single lever or piece of machinery. Once repaired, Nautilus moved on to Norway on its long journey north. But it was now months behind schedule, and all but Wilkins must have believed it was too late in the year to attempt the pole. Some little temporary trouble with the electric steering gear delayed us from starting again. But if things go well from here, I think we might even yet still accomplish much. A new member of the crew was capturing the scene in Bergen famed newsreel cameraman John Dorid. Dorid was hired to film the voyage into the unknown, but he also kept a diary that reveals a fascinating insight into the events that were to come. Argus 5th, 1931. It was far too late in the year to start the polar expedition, but I believed in Wilkins and was looking forward to the trip. No matter how busy I was to cover the story with my camera, I would have plenty of free time aboard. I wanted to spend a little of it writing a diary. Leaving was very moving. At least 300 people were on Quayside, and I think most of them were sure we would never come back home again.
We celebrated well last night. Nautilus now made its way slowly north along the Norwegian coast. When not dealing with mechanical problems, Wilkins was preoccupied with the demands of the Hearst media. He spent every spare moment writing upbeat reports to titillate public interest. But private notes told a different story. The weather's been stormy. We often lie at over 52 degrees. The bridge has been damaged and the rails totally destroyed. We're thrown out of our berths and have to crawl around on the floor. He was willing to take this on. I think this guy has to be impervious to his environment. And maybe as an explorer, he was. After traveling almost 5,000 nautical miles, Nautilus finally limped into Spitsbergen. It was the last inhabited land, just a few hours sailing from the edge of the frozen sea. Both engines need attention while we're at the pier here. If everything functions as required, we might reach the pole within two weeks. Hopefully the Nautilus will prove better than it now appears. But Wilkins well knows the Nautilus has never been reliable, and his closest colleague, Chief Scientist Sverdrup, advises caution. The season was so far advanced that, in my opinion, even an attempt to reach the North Pole would be far too dangerous. But Wilkins would not be swayed. He announced that after taking a day for repairs, they would sail for the pole. It was a somewhat irresponsible thing to do to push forward. Although he may have been convinced in his own mind that it would work. People thought it would take great courage to go under the ice in a submarine, but I can assure you it took more courage than even I had to go back on our word. We had put our hand to the plow, and it was necessary to go on. As they headed into the unknown, the crew was doing its best to make light of their fears, as Dorid's diary reveals. The gramophone is constantly playing jazz and Hawaiian music, which we already know of by our heart. The crew consists of 20 men of 10 different nationalities. We're all hairy and covered in oil and look like a real group of ne'er-do-wells. Every day we send radio broadcasts in our 10 different languages, but God knows if anyone listens to our program. Wilkins and Sverdrup began their experiments, making echo soundings and gravity observations, the first studies of the deep Arctic basin. The Nautilus gave Sverdrup a unique opportunity for research, but even he was beginning to fear what lay ahead. I was convinced we would return in one piece but I confess most openly that my conviction was based on nothing substantial. If I had known what the next few days would bring, I would have been singing a different tune. August 19th. At 80 degrees, three minutes north, we meet the first drift ice. For every hour that passes, it becomes heavier. Winter had returned with a vengeance. John Dorrid's diary recalls their discomfort. The weather is harsh, with wind and fog, and the ice is moving faster than normal. The cold goes right through. There is no heating on board, and inside the temperature is some degrees lower than outside. Water is constantly dropping from metal walls, and everything you touch is cold and damp. They said the condensation was just terrible. It dripped all over the place. It was almost like it was raining sometime, because they had no real 
insulation on the steel hull inside. Ice has frozen all over the deck, on the periscope and on the bridge. The fresh water tanks are also frozen solid. To increase our discomfort, a leak has sprung in the diving room and the cold water is slowly seeping through. After a week in the ice pack, the Nautilus had reached 82 degrees, further north than any vessel had ever been under its own power. 850 kilometers ahead, under huge drifting ice sheets, lay the North Pole. Wilkins had brought the leaky boat and its ragged crew to the edge of the known world. Now he ordered they go beyond. The submarine was prepared for diving. They would head for the pole. He was putting himself knowingly in a position where he was under the ice and had no sure way of getting up to charge those engines. So what he was betting on is that he was going to run into an opening in the ice or that he would be able to drill through with that drill, which they had never really done. Wilkins instructed the skipper, Sloan Dannenhauer, to prepare for diving. When Captain Dannenhauer set the controls in submerging position, the ship simply did not respond properly. When looking over the stern and down in the water, we noticed that something was missing from behind the propellers. Diver Frank Crilly volunteered for the job and we lowered him down between the ice floes to inspect the stern. In the freezing water, Crilly made a shocking discovery. The horizontal rudders, the stern planes, were gone. The stern planes to a submarine are sort of like the steering wheel to a car. Uh, you can't operate submerged without them. Uh, you'd be all over the place. I mean, it would be highly dangerous. Chief Scientist Sverdrup witnessed his leader's reaction. Wilkins showed no emotion. Not one muscle indicated that all of his plans had collapsed. He just put on his mittens and went astern alone. Sabotage. They'd, some of the sailors had made up their minds that they weren't going to do this. And they also realized, I think by then, they were in with a man of unprecedented, almost inhuman determination. He was going to go ahead with this come hell or high water. And uh, they didn't want to. And I think they realized that there wasn't any point in trying to sit down and talk to Mr. Dannenauer about it. They had to do something that would make it impossible for the submarine to proceed. Thus, the Nautilus is reduced from submarine to surface vessel. It is hard blow to all but worst for Wilkins. It seemed to be the end of his dream, but there were no recriminations. For the rest of his life, Wilkins would remain silent about the sabotage. But in a recently discovered private letter, he blamed the young seaman, Jensen, for the treachery. In New York, William Randolph Hearst publicly urges Wilkins to return and try again later in a safer vessel. But another totally contradictory message arrived from the Hearst Empire this time not for public consumption, effectively demanding that Wilkins continue to the pole, regardless of the risks. Sir Hubert Wilkins, Nautilus, stop. Editor Hearst newspaper asks formally whether or not you'll outcarry terms, stop. Contract says must attempt pole this year. Be assured every effort made to reach pole this year, stop. These plans held, therefore relying on your honor, Payment expected from you and News Chronicle. We had done, sometimes south, sometimes eastwards, and now suddenly towards the west. It seemed to us as if Wilkins cannot decide what he wants to do. 
Wilkins faced an impossible choice. Admit failure and return to ridicule and ruin, or continue and risk lives. Against all advice, he eventually made up his mind. Without exception, the others in the vessel want immediately to turn back. As commander of the expedition, I order the trials to continue. I am determined the vessel will go under and that as many experiments as possible will be made. He was indomitable and I'm sure that to have survived some of the things he did while he was exploring, probably had to have that personality. But courage is one thing when only your own life is at risk. But when you have a group of people whose survival is dependent on you, it puts a different burden on you. I think he was prepared to sacrifice his own life for this project into which he had put so much of his effort. Wilkins had built a career navigating the narrow border between discovery and disaster. Now he stepped across that line and ordered an incredible maneuver. Even if he couldn't make the pole, Wilkins was going to prove submarines could operate under ice. He would ram the ice sheet to force the sub beneath the surface. Captain Dannenhauer prepared the stricken Nautilus as best he could. The flows were quiet, and the only sounds to be heard were the mewing of the seagulls and the occasional splash of a seal as we lay between the flows ready for our first Arctic dive. Flood the main ballast. We took our time trimming down. After jockeying her into what I thought was the right trim, two degrees by the bow, and our eye ports well awash, I pointed her for a likely looking flow and gave the order. Ahead. The noise of the ice scraping along the top of the vessel was terrifying. It sounded as though the whole superstructure was being demolished. It looked like a dream. Through the eye ports, the crystal water changed from blue to green. Fish swam past in the strange, uncertain light. No human eyes had ever before looked upon the site. Above them was solid ice. Below, an ocean four and a half kilometers deep. We were under all right, for the first time in history. But could we get out again? The average ice then was about 10 feet thick. He had no navigation equipment. He had no way of knowing where he was. The Arctic Ocean is about the same size as the continental United States. Nautilus had disappeared from the face of the Earth. The worst was feared, and Norway prepared a rescue mission. In fact, the Nautilus had escaped after having traveled just a few miles submerged, then bobbing up through the ice like a bottle in a bath. But its radio had been damaged, and it would be a week before the world would learn that they had survived. The scientific team continued with groundbreaking experiments, solving important questions about the Arctic Ocean, results that are now recognized as exceptional. As a, an Arctic oceanographer myself, uh, I feel that the work they did was a landmark in science, and it's very difficult to do that kind of work uh, when 
the, the area they were operating in, the marginalised zone, is very difficult to work in even today. And the fact that they could do that in a submarine which was virtually crippled was a marvellous piece of navigation and of research. The results were vindication for Wilkins, but they hardly matched the hype expected of the great adventure. There is great satisfaction of having done your darndest against tremendous odds, even if you are beaten in the end. After a month in the ice, Wilkins eventually brought all his crew alive back to Norway. But he gambled everything on reaching the pole, and to the press, he was a loser. Randolph Hearst lived up to his threat and refused to pay. Nautilus, too damaged to continue, was scuttled. As it sank, it took not only Wilkins' dreams, but also his reputation. Buried by the Hearst Empire, it's only today that the audacity of the Nautilus journey and the amazing career of Wilkins can be appreciated. It was 25 years ahead of any other submarine work in the Arctic. Everything he did in a submarine under ice or in ice was completely untested before. So he had to do everything for the first time. And the fact that he achieved so much on that expedition makes it, I think, a, a tremendously successful expedition. The only reason it's, it's not better known is just because he didn't get to the North Pole, which um, is, in a sense, a, quite a trivial thing. The nuclear submarine Skate re-enters her home port at Groton. A triumphal return from her cruise under the Arctic ice to the top of the world, Commander James F. Calvert... And it would be others who would eventually reach the Pole and it was others who returned heroes. But James Calvert never forgot his debt to the modest Australian. In the autumn before he died, Wilkins met with Calvert as the young commander prepared to follow in his footsteps. This man was a dreamer. And dreamers are important. They think of things that other people would reject immediately as not being possible. Sir Hubert Wilkins didn't stop exploring, but he never again commanded an expedition. He saw out his days designing survival gear for the US Army. Financially ruined by Nautilus, he managed somehow to save the little farm he'd bought in Pennsylvania. Lady Suzanne Wilkins didn't travel on her husband's expeditions, happy to have him back for his brief appearances. He had a full life, three score years and ten packed with action and achievement. He died 70 years young, with a slight smile upon his lips. He was actually the explorer of the 20th century. And uh, it's uh, a real sadness and frustration that he is not better known. Because he really, it's not just what he did, but how he did it. I mean, it was this inquisitive mind, the desire to get new technology, the desire to, and the, the, the intelligence and the ability to carry out the courage to do things that may seem crazy at the time. Australia too turned its back on this remarkable man. Few recall his amazing exploits. He doesn't adorn the currency like other Australian heroes. Some locals have raised a little money to rebuild the family cottage. It will never be a tourist mecca. Wilkins never solved the mysteries of weather, but he hoped his work might inspire others. More than most, I have seen the unyielding, terrifying force of mysterious nature. We cannot tame it, I am sure, but its moods and vagaries are not random. 
There is a pattern to its movements, a plan. And one day, if we are brave and wise, we will find the solution.